where you worked in Belfast. My dad got me my start, then my brothers after me. You could hear the noise from where we lived, but nothing prepared you for the size of the They put me to work on 401. That's what we call her. We knew she'd be the largest passenger ship in the world, but we didn't call her Titanic then. I was there from the beginning. I watched the ship race play the key gloves. They sent big wooden gloves on the ship way to start with. Then the key is double that, like a backbone. And the frame is attached to that, like a skeleton. Workshops were everywhere. It took weeks to find your way around. The workshops were having trades we ever heard of. Painters, sail makers, coppersmiths, boiler makers, cabinet makers. I even learned a bit about French policy of them. Harlot was just a fine place to work, but dangerous. Every ship cost a life, and there'd be lots of injuries to save. I was in the engine works for a while. Very well equipped it was. That's where we built the triple expansion engines. Two of them, each as high as a three-story house. I worked in the frame bending shop. You had heat steel beams in the furnace, then hook them on the slabs of cast iron, and hammer them curved. It was skilled work. You had to bend them more than you needed because the frame straightened out a little when it cooled. The shell plates that made up the hull weighed up to four and a half tons. <laughs> they were taller than the dam. The plates were overlapped on the edges. Some were raised one after another. We called it clencher. One of the four men told me years ago that's how you built these ships. I worked as a heater boy. You had to heat the rivets on a wee plate. You put the bellows till the rivet was white hot. Then you get a hold of it with your tongs and throw it up to the catcher. And he put it in the hole in the plate with the holder up. There were two of us on the other side of the plate with the holder up. We had to hammer the rivets so it filled the hole before it turned all red. The double bottom. That's a wee space we call the tanks made up of steel plates. The rest of the river squad all had to fit into that gap. One of the four men would check each of it with a special hammer. If it made a rain sound, we'd have to go back and taste it out afterward. I'd get scared walking down in that double bottom. You only had candles for light. But the constant hammering against the shell plates, you could hear it all over Belfast. Some of those boys ended up stone deaf, so they did. We were paid 31 bob a week. The heater boy and catcher got 16 bob. But we all worked the same 54 hours. The upper deck was steel too, and part of the strength of the ship. There's no straight lines in the ship. And when you look down the water deck, you could see the shear of the hull, which stopped her flexing at sea. The stern frame had to be strong enough to take the rudder turning in heavy seas. You'd have all these timbers and guy wires to steady the frame, and men scurrying around like ants underneath. When we came to launch day, I was torn between pride and fear. The standing ways were coated in tallow, train oil, and soft soap. So the ship would slide when they shifted her weight off the blocks. That was the most dangerous part. And the shipwrights were knocking away the last props. They were under compression, you see, and the sliding ways would be released by the hydraulic trigger. One hundred thousand people watched the launch. Some paid a bob to sit in the reserve seating. There were extra trams laid on. Then we all went off to the pub to wish her well. Ach, you were proud to be an island man that day. And Titanic was the pride of Belfast.